And all this, of course, was to prepare for this island hopping campaign in the Pacific. That's what it was. And for Chuck Tatum, that started on the black sands of Iwo Jima. So they hit the beach on Iwo Jima. You know, after the workup, going overseas, more training in Hawaii, they finally get to this point where they hit the beach. And here he is on the beach for the first time. And here's what Chuck Tatum says. I noticed a lone Marine walking back and forth on the shore among hundreds of prone figures, kicking behinds, shouting cuss words, and demanding, move out, get your butts off the beach. He gave the Marine Corps hand signal for follow me. A group of men responded. Fascinated, I wondered why he wasn't digging in like the rest of us. As he advanced, as he advanced I recognized that the solitary Marine was none other than Gunnery Sergeant John Bazalone. Charlie Company's living legend and the Marine Corps icon was headed toward me and Steve. His dungarees were freshly washed in irons. His helmet, his helmet strap was unhooked. He held a carb carbine in his left hand and he had already ditched his cumbersome gas mask. Maslone wore a light field pack and showed no fear, as if this evasion was no more than a serious training maneuver. I also saw Colonel Lewis C. Plain, the 27th Marine's executive officer. He and Maslone were the only two men standing up, shouting obscenities and orders. The forward surge of Maslone's group carried them to our position. Only Maslone and Plain defied the firestorm raging around us. Move out! Move out! Get the hell off the beach, you dumb sons of bitches, they screamed, kicking us in the butts right and left. What I thought was yet another mortar shell falling in the same spot as before exploded 75 feet in front of Steve and me. The blast shock wave whipped up black dirt that pushed its way into my eyes and forced sand into my mouth, making me gag. It was uncomfortable and nasty, but my worry wasn't for myself. I hoped the dirt wouldn't foul our weapon. Basilone ran up, whacked me on the helmet, and pointed to the area where I thought the mortar shells had been regularly hitting. Only when the sand and dust cleared, I could see that Basilone was pointing at the aperture of a reinforced concrete bunker or blockhouse. The structure probably housed a 75 millimeter or larger cannon whose field of fire was directed down the beach to our right. It was a big bastard with incredible killing power. Its shells were stalling the advance by killing men of the 4th Division. It may have been firing tree bursts, which is basically anti-personnel shrapnel that explodes in the sky and rains down hell on ground troops. Running 35 feet to the spot picked by Baslone, our field of fire was now diagonal to the aperture of the blockhouse cannon. We opened fire again and the tracer rounds were right on target. Now I was pleased. My bullets forced the enemy gunners to close their gun port. With their armor port closed, the front of the blockhouse was blind. Even though it was temporarily out of commission, I still wanted to fire at it. Basilone signaled to me to commence firing again, and I directed, and then he directed a flamethrower operator, Corporal William Pegg, a Marine of imposing size, to repeat the precarious path taken by the demo man along our line of streaking bullets. So you got some cover and move going on. Mm -hmm. You got Chuck Tatum laying down fire, and now you got a, a flamethrower operator. And if you know anything about those flamethrowers, they're carrying big, giant, looks like scuba tanks on their backs. Mm -hmm. They weigh 70 or 80 pounds. And obviously, these are prime targets you know for the enemy because the enemy hates these things mm -hmm. so if you're wearing one of these things on your back you're you're getting sniper shots at you and everyone's trying to kill you basilone whacked me on the helmet to signal cease firing i didn't want to quit everything was working perfectly why stop i could see tracer rounds pounding into the building and let and felt extreme satisfaction with my accomplishment nevertheless i ceased firing as ordered and peg this peg is the guy carrying the the flamethrower staggered under the 70-pound weight of his tanks and equipment, cautiously moved toward the shattered bunkered walls. Sticking his flamethrower nozzle into the smoldering hole, he ignited his napalm, releasing 350 pounds per square inch of pressure in his tanks. There was a loud roar of the sound, and it looked like a fire-spitting dragon's jaw had erupted. The unsuspecting and stunned men inside didn't know the horror that was about to engulf them. They were cast instantly in the center of a roaring inferno, an incinerating, searing hell. 
I felt a surge of elation when the flames shot inside. It wasn't because of the gruesome conflagration and agony that were about to overwhelm the enemy, but because of our success. No one could live through Peg's napalm pyre. Sergeant Bazalone had directed this operation by the book, exactly the way we'd practiced it at Pendleton and Camp Tarawa. So it's perfect cover and move. And the reason he ceases fire is because you have to cease fire so that the so that the guy with the flame floor can actually get close enough. Because when you're shooting at that building, there's ricochets going all over mm-hmm. the place so that he has to cease fire at the last moment so the guy can get right up close. Mm-hmm. As I lay prone again, ready to fire, Bazalone stood astride my back, startling me. Bending over, he grabbed the machine gun bail in one hand with a practice motion, unlocked the tripod, releasing the gun. He screamed in my ear, get the belt and follow me. Bazalone ran toward the roof of the old blockhouse, grabbed what was left of the cloth ammo belt in my arms, and I followed him at a gallop up the slopes of the ruined emplacement. Standing on top, We could look down on the rear entrance. This is the rear entrance of the uh, pillbox. There was a low area, 30 feet in diameter, where some of the Japanese defenders had run to escape the blistering inferno inside. Bazalone cut them down, firing from the hip. The machine gun vibrated in its powerful arms. He sprayed the enemy soldiers, helped by the Bazalone bale, a wooden handle fastened by wire to the barrel of the weapon that was inspired by Bazalone's Medal of Honor engagement on Canal when he was burned carrying the hot machine gun. Without the bale, it would have been nearly impossible to control the blistering machine gun when its tripod was taken off. Mowing down the screaming Japs was purely a mercy slaying. Pitifully, The men were frantically trying to wipe away the still flaming jellied gasoline sticking to their tortured bodies. The putrid smell of burning human flesh nearly made me want to vomit. Bazalone's eyes contained a fury I had never seen before. His jaw was rigid, clenched hard, and sweat glistened on his forehead. He was not an executioner, but a true marine performing his duty. For me and others who saw Sergeant Bazalone's actions during our assault, his leadership and courage were overwhelming. Meanwhile, Charlie Company riflemen and Steve Evanson shot the Japs as they screamed in agony. Intense assaults. Just completely intense. And again, this is a guy that's already won the Medal of Honor. And he's out there taking charge and leading troops. He has no, he had no, um, was not required to be there. He could be back in the States with, you know, in Hollywood, rubbing mm-hmm. elbows with, uh, with, the, with the movie stars. But no, there, there he is, back in combat, back on Iwo Jima and leading. 